It is good to see you here this morning, um, especially good after last Sunday morning and many of us said, well, we couldn't have been here and uh, grateful that you're here this morning. It was a blessing with the snow and to our land and um, we're glad that you're here this morning. We'll be in Daniel chapter 3 this morning, but our story begins with King Nebuchadnezzar building a great statue to himself. It is nine feet wide and 90 feet tall. It's probably an obelisk like the Washington Monument in Washington, but just not quite as big. Nine feet wide, 90 feet tall, set on a plain in the valley. You can see this thing from a long ways off. It stands in the middle of that plain and it has etched into it the face of Nebuchadnezzar. And it has around it the writing of praise of how wonderful he is and what a great and mighty king he is. But that's not what makes this stand out. Ninety feet tall, nine foot wide, face etched on it and etchings around the base do not, are not what make this statue stand out. What make this monument stand out is that it's made of gold. The most precious building material in all the world. 90 feet tall, 9 foot wide, golden face, golden letters. This golden statue stands out on that plain near, near Babylon and it says, there's nobody like this king. There's no one in all the world like King Nebuchadnezzar. There's no one of his power. There's no one of his wealth. This statue says there is nobody like this king in all the land. Nobody in power, nobody in riches, nobody in majesty like this king. And this 90 foot tall, 9 foot wide statue has been prepared and they've taken an even larger curtain and they've draped it over the top. And he has ordered everybody in the kingdom, all of his satraps, all of his governors, all of his treasurers, all of his counselors, all of the administrators of the province, all of the treasurers to come for the unveiling of this golden statue on the plain. And when he is, everyone is assembled, the master of ceremony steps forward and says, You are commanded, O peoples, nations and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the drum, and the entire musical ensemble. You're to fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And when the band began to play, all the people fell down and bowed down and worshiped toward that golden statue. Oh, it was a good day. Weather was nice. Band was wonderful. Everybody's one of those moments where people were going to gather in the future and they're going to say, do you remember that day? Do you remember that day that we all went before that golden statue? Ah, it was that kind of day. Except there were three people in the crowd of thousands who were commanded to be there, who heard the band play and knew the command and did not bow down when the trumpets blew. Three people. And they came to him and they said to the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the drum, and the entire musical ensemble shall fall down and worship the golden statue. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There were certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these pay no heed to you, O king. They do not serve your gods and they do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. 
And Nebuchadnezzar was furious. It says in the scripture that his face was distorted. He was so mad at these three. Because he has a long history with these three guys. It starts back in the second chapter. Where Daniel along with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Have refused to eat the king's rations. They've chosen instead to honor a kosher diet. And not the diet full of the kind of foods that you and I like. And they've said, we're not going to eat that. We're going to eat our food. And the king said, no, you're going to eat your food. And Daniel said, I'll tell you what. Let's do a test. We'll eat our food for 10 days. The others in your care will eat your food for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, we'll see who is better off. We'll see who is healthier. We'll see who is stronger. We'll see who looks better. So they did. They ate the kosher diet for 10 days and the rest of them ate the king's rations for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego looked better. Their hair had a shine that the others didn't have. They were stronger than the others. They were better fit. And the king said, you're right. He said, you have a lot of wisdom. And Daniel interpreted a couple of dreams for the king and that, that helped out. So he made Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego governors over three provinces. He took these Hebrew boys who had first been disobedient and then he gave them positions of authority within the kingdom. Now, they won't bow down. Everybody else has bowed down. Why don't you bow down? And he called them in and he said, is it true? Is it true that you haven't bowed down? And they said to him, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you. If our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O oh king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we shall not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. And Nebuchadnezzar was even madder than he was before. And he ordered that the three the strong servants come in and they bound them hands and feet together with all their clothes on, their pants, their shoes, their shirts, their coats, their hats, bound them up and he ordered that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than it had ever been heated before. That's important. Now, if he's interested in making them suffer, he's going to say, cool that thing down to about 160 or 180. Let's put them in there. Let them suffer. But instead, he says, you heat that thing seven times hotter than it's ever been heated before. It's been a lot of years now, but I still remember when several stories up in the Tote station, Kent Wiley handed me a face shield one day and said, put this in front of your face. And then he opened a little door about this big into that cyclone boiler at Tote station. And even through that black shield, that fire inside that cyclone boiler was white hot and spinning. Some 2,800 degrees inside that boiler as that coal and air were mixed at an angle to create that cyclone of fire in there. Just a little bitty hole in a face shield. You could feel it. Nebuchadnezzar has said, you heat that furnace up seven times hotter than it's ever been heated before. What's he saying into this? He's saying, all of you who disobey me are going to be annihilated just like that. And as a matter of fact, it is so hot that the men that are now carrying Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because their feet have been bound and their hands have been bound they are now carrying them to put them into the furnace. It is so hot that the men who are doing the carrying die in the mouth of the furnace. 
They manage to get them in and then they die because of the intense heat that's on the outside of the furnace. They put all three of them in. And the king stands off at a distance and he looks in there. And he sees three shadows and one more. The Hebrew text says it is an angel of the Lord who has come into the fire to be with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and protect them. Christian Jewish, Christian tradition has taken the fact that it is the Son of God himself has come into the fire to be with them. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the middle of this cyclone of intense heat are fine. So Nebuchadnezzar, standing at the mouth of the furnace, hollers into the fire and he calls for them to come out. The king approached closely and he dared and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. I shout because he would have had to have shouted to get the voice over the flames of that furnace. And now they are no longer bound, but they walk out. And as they walk out of that flame, their shoes are fine, their pants are fine, their shirts, their coats, their hats are fine. Absolutely no indication that they've been in that fire whatsoever. My friend Lonnie had a fire in his home this fall. It wasn't a Luckily, fortunately, it wasn't a big fire. One of those exhaust fans in the bathroom caught fire, exploded in the attic. And his daughter happened to be home or things would have been very, very bad. But that smoke and that soot went throughout that house and it covered everything. And the insurance company sent in a cleaning company and they told them, we'll try to get this out, but this soot and these ashes are going to be in everything and it will, in time, ruin all of this fabric that it touches. They said, we can never get it all out. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out of the fire. Their clothes are fine. As a matter of fact, the scripture says, they don't even smell like smoke. And Nebuchadnezzar stands back and he looks at these three that have come out of that fire and he says, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted him. They disobeyed the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree. Any people nation or language that utters blasphemy against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb. He's done with fire at this point. And their house is laid in ruins. For there is no other God who's able to deliver in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. This story begins with the building of a statue, a 90 foot tall statue made of gold that is going to declare the, pray, the glory of King Knezer in all the world. It ends with King Nebuchadnezzar saying, there is no other God but this God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What began with self-proclamation ends with humble proclamation. And all they did was refuse to bend a knee and the Lord took care of them. No press releases. No attorneys. No organized marches or protest. Just three guys who said we're not going to do that and trusted the Lord. It's the first Sunday of Advent, a day that reminds us 
that this season of hope began when an angel of the Lord came to a little girl in a small Galilean village up in the mountains and said, Do not be afraid, favored one. The Lord has smiled on you and you're going to have a baby. And in that same village, the young man who was going to marry her received an angel visit from an angel in a dream and the angel said to him, don't be afraid to take her as your wife. She is carrying a child and he shall be named Jesus and he will deliver men from their sins. No fanfare, no press releases, no announcements, no big glorious public relations campaign. Just a young girl and a young boy in the nudge of the Spirit of God. It would come time to deliver that child and it was, you know, the government has a terrible way of t making timing. They had to travel to Bethlehem to sign their paperwork. It was his hometown, which is really better than having a website, I suppose. You can laugh about that if you want to. But they go to Bethlehem. Lots of people. Small town. Too many hometown folks. No place in the hotel. No room in a motel. No traveler's court. So she winds up in a stable. Surrounded by the animals that have come in with all the travelers. And she has that baby. No press releases. No protest. No organization. Oh, there would be the heavenly chorus that would sing that night and alert the shepherds on the hillside that the Son of God had been born and they would come and find the child wrapped in swaddling clothes in a quiet stable. But it starts out very small. For years they hear nothing from this baby. And then when he's about 30 he begins going around and teaching and he gathers a group of 12 followers. 12 followers. You can't do anything with 12 followers. Pours his life into these 12 people and he teaches them the things of God and they witness the hand of God on his life. They watch him as he performs miracles and they hear him say to them things like the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And they listen to him interact with various people and they hear them teach things that the people in authority don't like. You heard Barry read from John chapter 18 a while ago. That chapter begins with Jesus off by himself praying in a quiet garden. When Judas arrives with a band of Roman soldiers and they arrest Jesus and they are hauling him away and Peter jumps into the whack and takes a sword away from a soldier, swings at a guy's head and misses and it manages to cut off the guy's ear and it falls into the garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus said, Peter, that's not the way we're going to do this. And he reached down and he took the ear and he put it back onto the soldier's head and he healed it back into place. Now for you and I, that might be the end of that arrest. But in this fur fever pitched atmosphere, they carried him in and they put him before the high priest and he asked him all kinds of mocking questions and Jesus quietly refused to make a defense. Kind of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they carried him down to Pilate. And Pilate began to ask him, are you the king? And Jesus says to him, if I were the king, if I were the king, of this world. My followers would be here making a defense. But he said, my kingdom is not from this world. 
If my kingdom were from this world and my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews, but as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate said, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king, for this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. No fighting, no rebellion, no violence. Trust in God. Trust in God. This story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is a story that for centuries and generations has encouraged believers to say, I think God will take care of me and to trust Him. Jesus comes along and He uses the very same nonviolent methods and He never stands up and proclaims His own power. He simply stands back and says, For this I was born, and He trusts in God. I don't know the circumstances of the life in which you try to live your faith. I don't know if there are those in your school who say to you, I think Christianity is a hoax and you're forced every day to quietly and silently stand and say, I believe. There may be some people in your workplace who say to you, this Christianity, <coughs> Christianity doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. I don't believe any of it. And quietly and silently you stand in your place and you say, I will trust in God. Some of you are in families where you're the only believer in Jesus Christ and you have silently and strongly stood before your families and said this I believe. The example of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, give, Abednego gives us a hope that God will not forsake us. And the testimony of Jesus and his examples in facing those who disagree is that God will not forsake us. We have a hope that no matter the fires of this world, God will not forsake us. It is the example of our Egyptian brothers, our Baptist brothers and sisters in Christ, in Egypt, who in this last year have seen their, building, their buildings burned by the Muslim Brotherhood who have watched their pastors executed by a so-called democratically elected government. And those Egyptian brothers will stand and say, we believe God will take care of us. You and I think these stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are somewhere in the past. They're going on right now. And the hope in the world is that God will take care of us. Would you bow with me? Our Heavenly Father, on this Sunday of hope, I pray that your spirit impress upon all of us that we are not alone. That if persecution comes, you are with us. If we are forced to bow a knee, that you are with us when we refuse. Father, I pray, I, I plead for your spirit to speak to us today to give us all strength and the hope that we have in Christ. That no matter the forces of this world that fight against your people, you are with us in Christ. As you were with those three Hebrew boys, as you were with your son in the power of the resurrection, Father, give us strength to stand for the faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Our hymn of invitation this morning is Great is Thy Faithfulness. As Robert is centering our song upon the faithfulness of God in the midst of our circumstances. If you're here this morning, you've never accepted Christ as Savior, we invite you to come and say, I believe and I trust God with the hope of my life. If you're looking for a church home, come and join with us. If you have a need in your life you'd like to pray about, let me pray with you this morning and we'll call upon the hope we have in Christ. Let's stand. Let's sing together. Great is thy faithfulness and may the Spirit speak to us in this time.